Red Sea Rules number nine. View your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. Redeeming the Time Brothers podcast, a podcast by Gene Kissinger and Norman Kissinger, two brothers who have spent their lives in ministry and raising large families. Our desire is to provide a digital place for those who long to belong. We are currently going through the little book, The Red Sea Rules, by Robert J. Morgan. If you get a chance to pick it up, I would encourage you to. This is just a a, a brief devotional summary of it. It is a tremendous little book. I've given it away to more people than I think any other book, and I have given away hundreds and hundreds of books to people because I believe that leaders are readers, and when you learn to read the right stuff, it can really transform your life. This book is about 10 God-given strategies to get you through the crisis times of life, and you will have crisis times. I've always talked about storms this way. You are either in a storm, or you are going into a storm, or you're coming out of a storm. But if you don't have a theology that's strong enough to stand the storms, you're going to be in trouble. And so I want to help you with that. And Robert J. Morgan wants to help you with that. Red Sea Rules, number nine. Now, quickly to go over the first eight of those, we're beginning to wrap this series up. Red Sea Rule number one is realize that God means for you to be where you are. You are not where you're at accidentally. God is using your circumstances to shape you and mold you into the image of his son. Now remember the context of Exodus chapter 14 it finds the children of Israel on the, the coast of the Red Sea with two mountains on either side of them and Pharaoh's har- army hard after them. They literally have no way out of the situation. They're in a, a crisis cul-de-sac of sorts. They're between the, the devil and the deep Red Sea instead of the deep Blue Sea as our saying has. So we find ourselves caught there and so God is going to use this to build their faith. Red Sea rule number two. Be more concerned for God's glory than for your own relief. Uh, Mankind was created to bring great glory to God. And so if I'm looking constantly as to why I'm going through what I'm going through, and I'm trying to manipulate what I'm going through so that I can get out of this uncomfortable situation, I'm probably missing one of the biggest components of what God wants to teach me. And he wants me to look around to find out how he can get great glory out of my circumstances. Red Sea Rule number three, acknowledge your enemy, but keep your eyes on the Lord. Be aware of Satan and his strategies, but be awed by God and his possibilities. Red Sea Rule number four is pray. Just one word, you have not because you ask not. If you don't go to God in prayer, then you won't receive the things that God has destined for you to receive. You've got to come through the mechanism of prayer and find help in your time of trouble. Red Sea Rule number five, stay calm and confident and give God time to work. God is never late, but he's also seldom early. He comes at exactly the right time. When you find yourself in the fiery furnace like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you need to know, like Warren Wiersbe says, God's eye is on the clock, on the second hand of the clock, and God's hand is on the thermostat, and he'll never allow you to be in that furnace for longer, one second longer than is necessary. Red Sea Rule number six. When unsure, just take the next logical step by faith. The one of the, time, the problems of a crisis situation is we face the paralysis of analysis where we, we're not sure what to do. We don't know what to say. And uh, what Dr. Morgan talks, or our brother Morgan talks about is, is taking the next logical step by faith. And then number seven, envision God's enveloping presence. Understand that God wants to provide a protective barrier around you. How how Chuck Swindoll talked about it one time is that you and I as believers were in God's hands and whatever happens to us has to be filtered through his fingers. And so he protects us from the, the more devastating aspects of the current crisis in which we find ourselves. Sometimes we think we're at the mercy of the elements, but the reality is we are enveloped by the, the presence of God. And then trust God to deliver in his own unique way. God delivers them in a way they would have never come up with in a million years. Uh, He literally split the Red Sea in half in front of them and caused them to walk across on dry ground and then used the Red Sea as a weapon against the, the military might of Egypt and he got great glory on Pharaoh who thought, uh, Pharaoh thought that Pharaoh was God and God showed Pharaoh that God was God. 
Now, our current concept. Rule, rule number nine is view your current crisis as a faith builder for the future. Um, how are you dealing with the reality that God may not fix the situation the way you want him to? Sometimes God makes it pretty plain that he's going to do something his own way in his own time. And that can be frustrating to believers. And so sometimes they'll go through angst and doubt as a result of that. And so in your Red Sea crisis that you're praying through right now, are you trusting in God moment by moment to get you through it? Um, has it been difficult to place your trust in God when he may not uh, bring a resolution the way you wanted him to? Is, is it difficult to trust him when he's doing that? Or, or do you have any struggles with a God who is uh, who you expected to deliver you out of the situation and instead he's walking with you through the situation? He's giving you his presence in the midst of it rather than taking you out of it. In other words, sometimes God stills the storm around us. Sometimes God allows the storm around us to continue, but he stills the storm within us, causing us to be able to have a confidence in him in the midst of the crises. Now, even though we don't understand everything about God, one thing is clear. He wants to develop our faith, not only for our current journey, but also for the journeys down the road. Think about David and, Goli or David and Goliath, the story of the teenager and the giant, the little boy with five smooth stones and a sling and a giant with a massive spear the size of a weaver's beam who, who is uh, mocking the God of the uh, Israelites. And David steps out, picks the five smooth stones, hurls one and kills Goliath. But he didn't get there in one step. If you read the story in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, you'll find that David had already killed a bear and a lion with the sling. And so he knew that God could use that little weapon in his hand to take down something much larger and much more powerful than he was. And so you could say in a sense that the precursor to David killing Goliath was David killing a lion and David killing a bear. And then the faith that allowed him to do those two things then allowed him to do the third thing, which he was memorialized in the Bible as a result of doing. And so God is using uh, basic um, faith lessons in the current crisis. I, I call them FBI, faith building interventions, so that God is, is allowing us and walking with us through a lesser thing so that later on when a greater thing is in our way, we'll learn the lessons here that we're going to use there to gain victory. And the tragedy is sometimes we try to avoid learning these lessons and then we're totally incapacitated when the bigger lesson comes. So that one of the prophets said that if you can't run with the footman, what are you going to do on the day of the chariot? If you can't, if you can't keep up with the foot runners, how are you going to keep up with the horses? So you have to develop yourself along the way from faith to faith, Romans 1 says. Now, so somebody said this, trials are treadmills for your soul. Trials are treadmills for your soul. They get you in shape. It's coming the time of year. Christmas is going to come around and somebody's going to buy somebody a treadmill. And they're going to get the treadmill and the first uh, couple of days they'll use it and then it's going to become a clothes hanger in the bedroom. And because it's only a clothes hanger and dust gatherer in the bedroom, nobody's going to get in any shape. Trials are treadmills when you go when you actually work your way through them and walk your way through them you find you developing an internal stamina to be able to stand strong in the day of battle to be able to stand against the works of darkness against the satanic attacks that will come your way not might come your way will come and the tre the trial of tr it, it, trials are treadmills for your soul so we increase our faith through experiencing uh, this overcoming faith and this accumulative quality. Rule 9 is based on Exodus 14, 30-31. Let me read it to you. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore, and Israel saw the great work that the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. In other words, God is going to lead them through a four-decade journey. It's really important that he establishes right out of the gate that he's the one that's going to get them there. And he has the ability to do the supernatural. 
And, and so that's exactly what happens. They face a massive trial right up front and God gets them through it. So God's ability to get you through hard times, it, he, he's 100%. He's got you through the hard times in your life and he will continue to get you through the hard times in your life. So the two responses after uh, after Israel had headed towards uh, toward God after crossing the Red Sea was fear and faith. They feared God, a reverential respect of God, and had faith in God or trusted Him. God's not trying to cause you and I to be terrorized. He is uh, trying to cause us to be fortified, where, where we're strengthened in our inner man, and we have a reverential respect for a God who's bigger than our circumstances. Now, your faith is only as <laughs> your faith is only as big, as good as the object in which you place it. In the early days of the Sunday School movement, probably back in the early 1900s, there was a, a massive gathering of, of the Sunday School kids in this one community. There were about 800 kids there, and there was a series of speakers that were talking to these young Sunday scholars, and one of them was a big man, and he had a booming voice, and he had a way of really captivating the kids, and he's up there preaching, and he's preaching about faith, and he had a chair sitting in the middle of the platform, and he wanted to demonstrate to them the truth that faith is resting your whole weight on God, or resting your whole weight on something, and he was going to demonstrate how when you sit on the chair, you're, you're, you pick your feet up, and you're resting your whole weight on it, that's what faith is. So, <laughs> like you, if you've ever taught kids, you always want to be as dramatic as you can. So he was a big man, and he kind of he kind of flung himself up and back on the chair. Well, the chair just shattered. I mean, <laughs> the legs the legs split. The chair went down to the ground. He's laying there. His feet are <laughs> waving around up in the air. And of course, the kids just I mean erupted in laughter. It just he had a hard time getting them quieted down after he finally picked himself up. And he said, I set out to teach you one lesson about faith, and I taught you another. I set out to teach you that faith is, uh, that faith is resting your whole weight on something, but I taught you another lesson instead, that faith is only as good as the object in which you place it. And so your faith in God, you can be assured that that faith is well placed, and God is able to hold your weight up and take you completely through the crises. Warren Wiersbe said this, he said, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. A faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. We would welcome, uh, we should welcome our trials so that our faith will increase. We've learned, what have you learned about God and yourself in this journey? As you've uh, thought through your crisis from the perspective of these Red Sea rules, what has it taught you about yourself and what has it taught you about God? And how will these truths help you to face the future? Let's pray. Dear Lord God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for these Red Sea rules, and I pray that you'd help us to apply them diligently to our current crisis situations and develop into the men and women of faith that we need to be for the future. Give us your strength. Give us your blessing. Allow us to rest on this Sabbath day that we might be refreshed and launch into a new week of serving you tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you. You have a good night.